Psalms 138. Brother Steve brought me the mic back and handed it to me, and I said, you want me to turn it on while I'm singing? He said, please don't. So, Daniel, I won't be able to help you. When he announced this morning I was preaching, tonight I wasn't in here. And I asked Margaret, did everybody go running out the building? And she said, not yet. I see you're going to be serious tonight, so I better get serious. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word. Thank you for these young men that's got a big milestone in their life behind them, graduating high school. I pray that you'd bless them in a special way. You'd help them as they prepared the best they can for what's ahead of them. I pray that you would use them in a special way, help them to take what they have learned and they would apply it to their life, and they'd take a stand for you and live for you, no matter what comes against them. Help us now as we look into your word, what you'll accomplish, we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalms 138, verse number 2, says this. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. Now, I want to share with you just for a few minutes out of this portion of scripture. And I want to ask you this question. How reliable is your Bible? How reliable is your Bible? Uh, I don't want to single anybody out, but Daniel and Anthony, I hope that you have settled that you have a reliable Bible, Amen. that the Word of God is without error. Because as you start college, the devil already has in place teachers and students that's going to do their best to shake your faith and try to get you to believe that the King James Bible is not the Word of God. Now, the devil's very good at his job. I will give him that credit. But God has magnified his word above all his name. Now, his name is important. I don't like to hear anybody use God's name in vain. But God has magnified his word above all his name. Do you know a man is only as good as his word? A man is only as good as his word. If you can't take a man at his word, then you can't trust him. You cannot trust him. My daddy, when I was growing up, he said, a man that will lie to you will steal from you. And he was very adamant on us not being liars. You tell somebody you're going to do something, you keep your word. A man is only as good as his word in God is only as good as his word is. If his word has error in it, it's because he has error in him. And there is no error in him, Amen. therefore there is no error in his word. 
Now, you know when uh, people need answers to questions, they usually run to four different areas. A lot of people go to human reasoning or personal experience that they've had or somebody else had to try to answer hard questions. And some people, they go to religion, they'll go to mystical insight, Eastern philosophy or something like that, Eastern religion, and try to find answers. And then some people go to the church, I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church, they think the, that church is infallible, but it's not. But then there's a few people that go to the Bible, and that Bible is infallible. It has answers to our questions. You know, in, uh, in Australia, I was in a Bible study, one uh, midweek Bible study, and I said, if you've got a question, the Bible's got the answer. And there was a first-time visitor there, and she lifted her hand. She said, do you really believe that? I said, yes, I do. She said, may I ask a question? I said, yes, you may. I'm not afraid of questions. I can't answer them all, but I'm not afraid of questions. She said, my question is this, how do you get rid of head lice? Well, I ran out on the limb. And I said, the Bible's got the answer. You got a question, the Bible's got the answer. And she said, how do you get rid of head lice? And I thought, that's a good question. Now what am I going to say? I ran out on a limb, saw the limb off behind me. And there was a lady there, she said, uh, what Brother Mike meant was this. If you have a spiritual question, the Bible has a spiritual answer. Now it does have some answers for hygiene, but what Brother Mike meant was, if you got a spiritual question, it's got a spiritual answer. And I said, yeah, that's it. That's what I meant. <laughs> you know, you are only as good as your word. God is only as good as his word is. If his word's no good, he's no good. And I said a minute ago, you can't depend on somebody that you can't take them at their word. So what if the Bible's not word for word, the word of God? Then where, where are we going to go to tell us what words in the Bible are the word of God and what words are not? What book are we going to go to that some man has written? You know, there's a lot of books written teaching that the Bible's fallible. And then there's a lot of books written that teaches the Bible is infallible. So which book does, do we go to? Well, why do we have to go to any book that man wrote? Why can't we just go to the Bible, God's Word, and see what God's Word has to say about it? God in, has said he has magnified his Word above all his name. Do you know God's word is more important to him than his name is? Because if his word's no good, his name is no good. So what I want to do is I want to look at a few places in the Bible and see what men in the Bible, what the word of God teaches about God's word. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, if you want to turn there, please. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through verse number 3. It's King David. King David. I want to see what he thought about God's word. Verse number 1 says this. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying. So King David is on his deathbed. He's about to die. He calls Solomon in, who is going to take over and be king of Israel. He calls him in, and he has some things he wants to say to him. Here's what David says. I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, 
that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest and whithersoever thou, thou turn thyself. He's telling Solomon, if you want to be a real man, you're going to have to have some faith in God's Word. You're going to have to put into practice what's taught in the Word of God. You hear me, young men? You're going to have to take a stand, and if you're going to be a real man for God, you're going to have to take a stand and put God's Word into practice if you're going to show yourself a man, one that God's pleased with. Okay, now, so David's on his deathbed, and he's given some instructions to his son. If you were on your deathbed, what would you tell your kids? What would you say to your children? Would you tell them the best joke you've ever heard? Or would you tell them, the, I mean, the most important thing on your heart? You give them some instructions that would help them the rest of their life. Not only that, they're taking over the kingdom of Israel. They're going to be king. So what would you tell them? You would tell them that they, he's telling Solomon, you can put your trust in the word of God, in God's word. Now, when you read these verses, you can see that David has confidence in God's word. He's got complete confidence in his word. Do you know how many hundred years David lived after Moses? You know how many hundred? Anybody want to guess? Very good. Five hundred years after Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, David laying on his deathbed points 500 years back and said, you can have faith in what God wrote down, had Moses to pin down. 500 years. Now the question arises in my mind is this. I wonder if David had the original. 500 years or did he have a copy? I mean, if, if, if the original lasted 100 years and then they wrote a copy and it lasted 100 years, I mean, he's probably on the fifth copy. So he has to believe that God has preserved his word, whether he has the original or he's got a copy of a copy of a copy. He does not cast doubt on God's word after 500 years. If you was on your deathbed, what kind of advice would you give your children? I read of a young preacher one time, he was preparing a message and he went to his dad and he said, Dad, if you was to die, what would you want put on your tombstone? His dad pondered for a while and thought, and he said, put this on there. He prayed. The son went away and thought, that's good. People walk by and say, he prayed. He went to his mother and he asked his mother, said, uh, what would you want on your tombstone? If he died, she had a bad eye. She had a, she said, I put this on her. I told you I was sick. That was a joke for you all that didn't get it. I told you I was sick. No, if you was on your deathbed, you'd tell your children the most important thing that's on your heart. And David pointed his son to God's word. God has magnified his word above all his name. Now, just for sake of time, let's, let's, let's jump through time. Let's get to the last book in the Bible, to Malachi. Malachi chapter 2, verse number 7. Malachi chapter 2, verse number 7. It says this, For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. That Lord is all capitals. Now, Malachi is not casting any doubt on God's word. And he's saying that the, the, pre, the priest's lips 
they're, when they talk, when they preach, when they speak, they're supposed to preach forth the knowledge of God, the Word of God. Now, do you know how many hundred years Malachi is after Moses? Anybody want? Anybody want to guess? Ten plus one, anybody? Eleven hundred years. Y'all are good. Eleven hundred years after Moses, Malachi does not cast any doubt on the Word of God. But he's still preaching from the law of Moses and instructing the people. Do you think he had the original? You think Malachi had the original? Or you think he might have had a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy? I mean, if they lasted 100 years, he's on the 11th copy. What I'm trying to get you to see, young men, is God is able to preserve his word for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. That people did not cast any doubt on the word of God. Malachi chapter 4, verse 4 says this, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him and Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgment. See, he's got faith in God's word after 1,100 years. No doubt, he doesn't cast any doubt at all. He refers to the law of Moses with utmost confidence. So when you get, young men, when you get into college, and you got these professors that are educated above their intelligence, then when they try to shake your faith in the Word of God, just let it be like water on a duck's back, just run off. Just let it run off. You got the Word of God and you know it. You know it. Don't get off somewhere and then start doubting God's Word. Let it go in one ear and out the other. You know, like sometimes when your parents talk to you, in one ear and out the other. You are only as good as your word. God is only as good as his word. I wonder what Jesus thought about the scriptures. I'd like to see what Jesus thought about them. Luke chapter 24, verse 25 through verse number 27. Let's see what Jesus thought about the scriptures. Do you know how many hundred years after Moses, Jesus is? Anybody want to take a guess how many hundred years? Anybody? Anybody? I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. 1,500 years. Do you think Jesus had the original? If anybody had the original, you'd think the Lord Jesus would. Do you think he might have had a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy? If a, if a copy lasted 100 years, he's on the 15th copy. So God evidently is able to preserve his word for 1,500 years, whether he has the original or he has the copy. God is able to preserve his word. Let's see if Jesus casts any doubt on God's word. Verse 25, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Talking about the Old Testament scriptures. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You know what that you know what that Old Testament tells us about? Brother Kelly's been telling us. Brother Steve's been preaching about it. It's telling us about Jesus. It's to tell us about his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, 
and they're going into detail to show us that God is keeping his word. Look at verse 44 in Luke 24. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, then in all thing that, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. He is acknowledging the Moses, right? The prophets and the Psalms. The law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Do you know, do you know, we have, in our Bible, we, our Bible has two parts, Old Testament and New Testament. In Jesus' day, all they had was the Old Testament, and it had three parts. You know what it was made of? The law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Je Jesus is acknowledging the complete revealed Word of God in his day. He is not casting any doubt at all whatsoever upon the Word of God. He's, he's not said, oh, I, I need to apologize to you. I, I'm sorry my father wasn't able to keep his word. I'm going to straighten this mess out while I'm here. No, he didn't say nothing like that. He acknowledges the complete revealed Word of God. Doesn't cast any doubt on it whatsoever. Tells them they're a fool and slow of heart for not believing it. So those teachers or students that try to tell you that the Bible is not the Word of God with that error, you know what Jesus would say to them? He'd tell them they're a fool and they're slow of heart for not believing God's Word. Matthew chapter 24 4 verse 35 says this, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. 1,500 years have passed, and Jesus says his word's not going to pass away. God's word does not lie. God is able to preserve his word. And you're only as good as your word, and God is only as good as his word is. If God preserved his word for 1,500 years, don't you think he could preserve it another 2,000 years? I wonder what the Apostle Paul thought about the word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You don't, you don't have to run to some book some man wrote or some book some man or some woman wrote to try to prove that the Word of God is the Word of God, you can go to the Bible and see what the Bible teaches about the Bible. You know, there's people who tell you that Jesus is a good man. Well, would a good man lie to you? No, a good man wouldn't lie to you. And he's acknowledging the Word of God. So if the Word of God is, has error in it, that means Jesus is not a good man. But Jesus is a good man. Good men, good people, good men and women don't lie to you. Listen. Let's see. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15. Here's what Paul says. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So he says the scriptures are holy. Then he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means God breathed. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, in, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, and all good works. So Paul is saying in verse number 15 that God's word is holy. He says in verse 16 that it's inspired of God and is profitable. He says in verse 17 that it will enable you to be perfect. That means full-grown, mature, grown up. 
be what you ought to be for the glory of God. It will thoroughly furnish you unto all good works, verse number 17. That's God's word. That's God's word. Paul was shipwrecked, beaten, how many times? Three times, at least beaten three times, recording in the word of God. For preaching and teaching the truth. You'd think after the first time, if he believed God's word had error in it, he would have said, I ain't going to do that no more. That hurts. He took a stand for God no matter what. He was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra. He is caught up into the third heaven for his belief in the word of God. So when you all go off to college, you take a stand. Anytime you stand for God, uh, sometimes it's not pleasant. But I promise you it'll be profitable in heaven. How, you know, how can, how can something make you perfect if it's not perfect itself? Did, did you hear me? How can something make you perfect, thoroughly furnish you, if it's not everything it needs to be itself? You know, most likely Paul didn't have the original copy. Most likely he had a copy of a copy of a copy. But he doesn't cast any doubt on God's word. He, he has complete faith and trust in God's word. Could I say God's able to preserve his word for hundreds, yea, thousands of years? And you're only as good as your word is. You've probably not heard me say that yet, but you're only as good as your word is. And God is only as good as his word is. If his word's no good, he's no good, but God's good and his word's good. Amen. I wonder what the apostle Peter thought about God's word. I'll, just, I'll, I'll tell you this before you can get started. Peter thought it's incorruptible and that it would endure forever. 1 Peter 1.23 says this, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Peter said God's word is incorruptible. No matter what anybody says on this earth, no matter what they try to do, God's word is incorruptible. It will accomplish that which he sends it forth to do. Now, I'm not saying they can't distort it or twist it or anything like that, but God's word is incorruptible. Could I say this to you? There's no such thing as a New King James Version. I'm getting sidetracked a little. That's not in my notes. There's no such thing as a New King James Version of the Bible. Because the New King James is translated from the same manuscripts, the RSV and the ASV and that non-inspired version and all that other mess is translated from. They're translated from, from manuscripts that everybody knows and believes has error in it. So the devil is sly and sneaky. He said, well, I'll just play off the King James, the good name of the King James Bible, and I'll have another one, and I'll call it the New King James. But it's not. There's no such thing as the New King James. First Peter one twenty five says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. First Peter 2.2 two. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Anybody like drinking spoiled milk? I don't even like buttermilk. Spoiled milk. You wouldn't give your spoiled milk to a uh, spoiled milk to a baby, would you? No. You give them good milk. Do you know why you don't need to read? or use one of those other versions of the Bible because it's not good milk. It's not sincere milk. It's not genuine 
good for you, good milk. Newborn babes are going to grow when they read and hear preached the sincere milk of the word. Amen. They're going to grow proper that way. They're going to grow proper that way. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16 through 21. If you want to turn there, you can listen. Here's what Peter says. We're still seeing what Peter's got to say about the scriptures. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He said, I'm going to tell you something I saw with my own eye. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son, son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard. He said, I'm telling you about something I saw with my eye. I heard with my own ear. When we were with him in the holy mount, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Wherein do you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first that no, let me just tell you about that. Paul said, I mean, Peter said, I was on the Mount Transfiguration. I saw something that absolutely amazed me. I saw Jesus transfigured right before my eyes. I heard God's voice from heaven with my own ear. But I got something better than that. I've got the Word of God. He said, I got something better than what I saw in my eye. I heard with my own ear. I heard God's voice. Audibly, we have a more sure word of prophecy. I got something better than that. God pinned his word down for us. Amen. Then he says, knowing this, that no first, that no, prophe uh, no prophecy of the scripture is in of any private interpretation. In other words, it don't mean one thing to you and something else to me. God said what he meant, and he means what he sa said. There is one true interpretation. Now, we can apply it different ways, but there's one true interpretation. We can't twist it around. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You know what I believe through my heart? When God breathed his word, he had his human writer sitting there saying, you know, what I need to say. And the Holy Ghost is standing right behind him over his shoulder and said, say this. In the beginning, God. He said, I like that. And he looked at me. God spoke to him and breathed to him his word and man pinned it down just like God gave it. You see, my faith is not in the men that pinned it down. My faith is in God that breathed it. Peter's got complete confidence in God's word. He doesn't cast any doubt on it at all. Acts 17, 11 says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. When they heard something preached, they said, I'm going to study that out. I'm going to look that up for myself. That sounds good, but I want to make sure that's right. John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Psalm 68, 11, The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. Psalms 12, 6 and 7, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Listen to this. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God is in a preservation business. He is preserving his word. Psalms 19, verse 7 through 10, The law of the Lord is perfect, Converting the soul. 
The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired. Listen to this, talking about the Word of God. More to be desired are they than go, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Would you rather have a pile of gold or a precious copy of the Word of God? You say, well, if I had a pile of gold, Brother Mike, I could buy me a Bible. No, you couldn't because I didn't put that in there. <laughs> You're just going to have to make your choice. Pile of gold, Word of God. That's all you get, two choices. Pile of gold, Word of God. And no, you can't bribe me. I can't, I won't put a third one in it. Pile of gold, word of God. God, here's how God looks at his word. His word is more to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold. He said it's even sweeter than a honeycomb. Moreover, by them thy servant is warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. If you and I would put a value on the Word of God like we should, we'd find out there's great reward. Amen. Great reward. Psalms 33, 4. For the Word of the Lord is right, and all His works are done in truth. Psalms 138, 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness for, and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God has magnified His Word above all His name. Amen. If His Word's no good, His name's no good. And I believe all my heart that His Word's good. Amen. His Word is right and true altogether just like He teaches. Let me ask you a question. What do you think of God's Word? How reliable is your Bible? If God can pre preserve his word for 1,500 years, he can preserve it for another 2,000 years. I mean, Jesus didn't cast any doubt on it. Why should we? <coughs> Peter didn't cast any doubt on it. Paul didn't cast any Malachi, David on his deathbed, gave the best advice he could to his son. Put his faith in the Word of God. Amen. I want you to know with all my heart that we've got the preserved Word of God in what we call the King James Bible. Do you know that it's the only version that anyone believes is without error? All those other versions that people believe, there's nobody believes that they are without error. Have it settled in your heart before you go off to college, before you go off to school, because there's going to be people that's going to try to shake your faith in the Word of God. The, word, the Bible's our foundation. And if our foundation is moved, if, if our foundation is taken away, there's, I mean, everything is taken away from us. We can't stand. It's Satan's job to make you doubt and put others in your way to challenge you. To challenge you. So have it settled. If you need to call home for backup, call home for backup. Don't swallow anything hook, line, and sinker. If it sounds wrong and seems wrong, more than likely it's because it's wrong. Anybody, look, anybody that tries to say this right here is not the Word of God with that error. I don't care what kind of degrees they've got or what temperature they're running. They don't know what they're talking about. They do not know what they're talking about. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the 
privilege you give us to look into your word. I pray that you'd help these young men to stand for you no matter what. Give them guidance and direction. Help us as a church to be.